Hello, this is Dr. DeMaio. This is your lecture on the appendicular skeleton, including the pelvic girdle, comparing the different male and female pelvis, going through all the landmarks of the pelvis, the lower extremities, including the femur, tibia, fibula, and the foot. Okay, so let's move along. So in this image right now, we're looking at the comparison of a male versus a female pelvis. I mean, right away, you can see under the female, this is the image of the female. Oh, hold on a second, let me get my pen here. This is the Im image of the female, right? And this one is the image of the male over here. So if you notice right away, you can see something. The male, female, uh, the male pelvis is taller more narrow, females more uh, shorter and wider. See the pelvic brim here is much wider here and the pelvic outlet and inlet. So you have an inlet coming in and an outlet coming out. Now notice the angle here at the outlet and the size of the inlet. Baby's head has to be able to, and the entire body has to get through this inlet and come out the outlet. And so if you look at it, this is just a regular female and a male. It's not like a pregnant female, whatever. And you can see the obturator foramen looks different than this one, right? You can see how long the ilia and, and the, the entire innominate bone or um, coxal bone, and we'll talk about that. Okay, so if you look here, it says the general structure modifications it is a tilted forward uh, more adaptive for childbearing. The pelvis, uh, the true pelvis defines the birth canal. We'll talk about true pelvis versus false pelvis. I mean, false pelvis above. If you took an imaginary line across from the pelvic anterior portion of the superior aspect of the sacrum, and you imagine taking a piece of paper and just covering this area right here. So this area above this area is the false pelvis. The area below and his side is the true pelvis. The same thing with the male as well. You know, so you take an imaginary piece of paper, cover from the superior anterior aspect of the sacrum, and just cover that hole. That's the pelvic inlet. And so everything above here up to this point, so from here to here, is the false pelvis. And inside this area and inside this area is the true pelvis. Let me just erase it for a minute so you can see things a little better. Okay, come back. Now, um, so looking at the female pelvis, the birth canal is much bigger and open and wider. It's broader, it's more shallow, has a greater capacity. Uh, the, the bones, um, the bone thickness is much less than a female. It's a little thinner and smoother. And the female acetabula, that's this spot right here where the femur head is going to fit in. The acetabula are smaller and further apart. See how close the acetabula are here versus the female. Right? And it's a lot bigger in the males, the acetabula. That's the socket for the hip. But this thing, the pubic arch angle, this is a dead giveaway right here. See the angle here, com the angle here compared to the angle here. So you take an angle like that, an angle like that, and you can see that the pubic arch is much broader, about 80 to 90 degrees more rounded. It's so much more, 80 degrees more rounded, and the male is more acute, like 50 to 60 degrees more narrow. That's another telltale sign. Now in this view, we're looking at um, a lateral view of the pelvis and a view from underneath inferior view, posterior inferior view here, and a lateral view here. And you can see that the female is much wider and the curvature is accentuated and more movable. Okay, the coccyx is much more movable. The female coccyx can actually move more than the males. And the male's coccyx is more curved ventrally this way. The sacrum is shorter and wider is what I'm saying. And the sacral curvature is more accentuated the males a little straighter down and then looking from the inferior posterior inferior view this is the coccyx looking right at us this is the pubic bone up here you're looking from underneath like their feet are hit it would be right coming towards your face 
Um, it's much wider here and more oval from side to side. And you know, it's much wider and more oval. And then the ischial tuberosities are much, um, uh, uh, it's, are much shorter and further apart. So the ischial tuberosities, we'll talk about, they're longer, and that's what you sit on. And you can see the pelvic inlet here is much more narrow. It's like a heart shape. So the pelvic girdle or hip, the hip is formed by a pair of hip bones, the os coxae or coxal bones, individual each side has three parts. It has the ilium, the ischium, and the pubic bone. And sometimes they call that bone the inominate, inominate, which means what is it? Together with the sacrum and the coccyx, these bones form the bony pelvis. So the pelvis is a con combination of several bones. So we look at the pelvis or the pelvic girdle, that's attaching to the lower limbs to the axial skeleton. So it attaches your legs to the axial skeleton. It helps to transmit the weight of the upper body to the lower limbs, and it supports the visceral organs of the pelvis. Here it is, three separate bones, ilium, ischium, and pubic. So if you put a line, if we look, we'll look at the lateral view, but you'll see um, from here above is ilium, ischium is just down at the bottom here, and you'll see that the, the pubic bone is right here. This is more of the pubic bone right here. So you have an iliac fossa here. You can see anterior, this is the anterior view. You can see how the sacrum is lodged in between. It creates a joint between the ilium called the sacroiliac joint. And this is the top or base of the sacrum, and L5 would be sitting on top of that. And it's articulating with its superior articulating sets of the sacrum. And L4, L5 would actually, if I said L4, I don't know why. L5 has inferior articulating facets that articulate with the sacrum too. You're looking at the anterior view, and you can see this is the coccyx. Uh, coccyx starts right here, and this is all sacrum. And the sacrum has anterior sacral foramina and posterior sacral foramina. We talked a little bit about that. Looking at this from the front, we have another couple of landmarks here I want to bring to your attention. And it doesn't really talk about here too much, but we have the anterior superior iliac spine. And then you have an anterior inferior iliac spine. And you can see it better from a lateral view. So the anterior superior iliac spine will be here and the anterior inferior will be here. Here's your pubic symphysis. That's where the joint of the pubic bones come together. That is a fibrocartilage disc. Um, this is the obturator foramen. I don't know why it's that lot marking, but that's the obturator foramen. The obturator foramen allows blood vessels and nerves to pass through. It's the largest foramen in the human body is the obturator foramen. I always try to sing the song. He's a smooth operator, right? <laughs> smooth obturator. Okay, so I know, get a new job. So uh, this is the iliac fossa. This is the iliac crest up top. That's what you do for landmarks for posture, looking at a high hip or a low hip. And um, let's go through it. We'll see it better in other images. So the ilium is a large flaring bone that forms a superior region of the coxal bone. It consists of the body and a superior wing-like portion called the ala. The broad posterior lateral surface is called the gluteal surface. The auricular surface, where it articulates with the sacrum, uh, they call it auricular, it kind of looks like an ear or receiving an ear, and that forms a sacroiliac joint. The major markings include the iliac crest. There's four spines, greater sciatic notch, iliac fossa, and arcuate line and the pelvic brim. We're going to go through them. Okay, here's a great view. So we're looking at a lateral view of an ilium, see? Lateral view. And we're looking, which one is posterior, guys? I can always tell what's posterior for me because we look for this notch right here. That's the greater sciatic notch. What do you think passes through there? I want you to know it. The sciatic nerve. Okay, so this is the top of the iliac, 
or and there's a tubercle of the iliac crest but this would be called the iliac crest right here uh, this whole thing coming around like a crest of a wave and then this is the anterior side right so this is that anterior superior iliac spine and this is that anterior inferior iliac spine and on the back you have a posterior superior iliac spine and a posterior inferior iliac spine i say it like that it goes all the way back to when i first studied it with my study partner we had to do keep our minds and so you just do silly things and we always said it like that so these are good landmarks you know if you see uh, someone in a bikini in a very low bikini laying on the beach this is anterior right and sometimes the bikini just comes to about here and you can see these bones sticking out and then maybe they're wearing a brazilian cut you may see this bone sticking out if we see the pubic bone here's the pubic bone in red if you see the pubic bone in someone's bikini we're talking about a very tiny bikini you can sing the song she wore a itsy bitsy teeny tiny polka dot bikini <laughs> that she wore for the very first time she probably wore it for the last time too because she probably got ridiculed for it anyhow so this is the pubic bone right here and if that sticks out we're really low guys you know so sometimes you it's pretty common sometimes in some bikinis you see this bone stick out not that i'm looking at bikinis i mean i wouldn't be doing such a thing okay and the posterior superior iliac spine this is a great landmark for doing um si joint uh functional testing so i can show you in the lab i'm going to show you guys how to check somebody's sacroiliac joint to see if it's working properly in other words sometimes it gets locked up and the interesting thing about this ilia movement when you hip flex and hip extend these this joint is moved by large long bones there's no like an individual bone that moves it in and out so sometimes it gets hung up out of alignment and you can actually as a chiropractor it's a very common thing to adjust on patients um and you can adjust from the back you can adjust from the front there's many different techniques um, there's so many different approaches you can use blocking and so on just like kind of rest them on something and let the ligaments relax but anyhow this is the greatest sciatic nerve this is a very important landmark because the sciatic nerve passes through there and if someone was going to do an injection you got to be careful when you do a gluteal injection that you don't inject into the sciatic nerve so you need to know your landmarks and then this right here is a spine this is the ischial spine right here i don't know why they didn't mark it that's the ischial spine and so this blue part of the bone from here all the way down and around that is the ischium this red bone is the pubic bone and this whole top bone here is the ilium this is called the sacral ala right there okay now i always say it's kind of like a mercedes-benz um or hood ornament you know you ever see the mercedes-benz sign or the hood ornament it kind of has a line here a line here and a line there right in a circle almost looks like a mercedes-benz right sign so what is that all about these are three bones one two three bones right forming one coxal bone so the ilium is the top the ischium is the back and this is what you're sitting on right here this is a landmark this is the ischial tuberosities this is that smooth obturator the largest uh, foramen in the body for blood vessels and nerves this is the acetabulum that's where the femur head's fitting in and there will be a ligament attaching here because when you look at the femur the femur has a hole for that ligament the the fovea capitis and this is there's a ligament that helps to snap it in kind of like a doll you ever see those dolls with the elastic uh, band that snaps in you can pull the leg and it snaps right back in right and this is the anterior inferior iliac spine these are attachment points for muscles and this is the anterior superior iliac spine and here's the iliac crest okay so now we're looking at a medial view and again you can see the iliac fossa again we saw that on the first view when you see this big area so this is anterior right here right that's the anterior view now and now this is the posterior view in the back so there's a little bit of that posterior superior iliac spine 
Here's that posterior inferior iliac spine. And then here's the anterior superior iliac spine. Here's the anterior inferior iliac spine. And here's the iliac crest again going across the top. This is the fossa anteriorly. And then this is that auricular surface for the auricular portion of the sacrum to articulate and helps to form the sacroiliac joint. Here's your pubic bone again. Here's your ischian bone. Now this is still just talking about the ilium. That's why they didn't mark it here. They didn't mark the pubic and the iliac bones, ischial bones here. We'll look at it in a few minutes. Now we're talking about the ischium. It forms the posterior inferior part of the hip bone. The thick body articulates with the ilium and the thinner articulates with the pubis. And the major markings, I would say, ischial spine is one, the lesser sciatic notch, and the ischial tuberosity is a biggie. That's the one you sit on. You know, when the, when the um, yoga instructor says, everybody get on your sit bones, I feel like bopping it in their head. <laughs> it's not a sit bone, it's an ischial tuberosity. That's what you sit on. Okay, so then we have the pubic bone. The pubic bone forms the anterior portion of the hip bone, and it articulates with the ischium and the ilium. The major markings include the superior and inferior rami, the pubic crest, pubic tubercle, pubic arch, and the big one, the pubic symphysis, where it comes together. Also, of course, the largest foramen in the body is the obturator foramen. He's going through there. So here it is. There's that obturator foramen. This is the pubic body. Okay, this is the inferior ramus. And the articular surface of the pubis is going to articulate um, with the actual ischium here. It doesn't show you the pubic symphysis here because it's not together with the other one. Here's that pubic tubercle. And here's the inferior ramus. And there's the articular surface at the pubic symphysis right here. You can see it much better here. Okay, the comparison of the male and female pelvic structure. The female pelvis is more tilted forward. It's more adaptive for childbearing. The true pelvis divides the birth canal. The cavity of the true pelvis is broad, shallow, and has greater capacity. The male pelvis is tilted less forward. It's adapted for support of heavier male build and stronger muscles. The cavity of the true pelvis is narrow and deep in the male. Again, comparison of male and pelvic structures. We looked at this before. This is the female. This is the male. Okay. We're looking at the comparison of male and female pelvic structure. We're looking at characteristics. And we look at bone thickness, pubic arch angle, acetabula, sacrum, and coccyx. Like I said, this is probably the most significant. The female has an 80 to 90 degree angle at that pubic arch. And the male is only 50 to 60. The female is lighter, thinner, and smoother. The male is more heavy and thicker and more prominent markings. The female has a smaller, farther apart acetabula. The males are closer together. The sacrum is wider, shorter, and has more of a curvature. The females, the males have a more narrow, longer sacral promontory. And the female's coccyx is more movable, and the male co coccyx is less movable. Okay, the lower limb. There's three segments of the lower limb. They are the thigh, the leg, and the foot. We're talking about your leg. When people commonly call it the leg, but there's three basic parts. You have the thigh where the femur head is. I'm sorry, the femur is. And the leg, which has two bones, the tibia and the fibula. And then the foot has many bones. They carry the weight of the erect body and are subjected to exceptional forces when, on, when someone jumps or runs. The, the sole bone of the thigh is the femur. So when we talk about the, the thigh, the femur is the bone we're talking about. It's the largest and strongest bone in the body. It articulates proximally with the hip and distally with the tibia. The proximal articulation is with the um, acetabulum of the, of the hip. And the distal articulation is at the, the femoral condyles on top of the tibia, the tibial plateau. The major markings include the head of the femur, the fovea capitis. We talked about that little, it's like a little, a little indentation for that ligament that stays with the bone. 
and the greater and lesser, not tubercle, but greater and lesser trochanters. There's a gluteal tu uh, tuberosity. There's a lateral and medial condyles, as I just said, and there's epicondyles above. And there's a thing called the linea aspera and the patella surface and the intercondyla notch. Here's the femur. Looking at the top, this is the head. This is the head. And you can't really make it out, but that is where the fovea capitis is. Let me just erase that for a second. So the fovea capitis is going to be a little indentation right there. And so this makes up the head. And you have a um, intertrochanteric crest on one side. So this is the posterior view. And on the anterior view, it's the intertrochanteric line. Why? Because it's, you could, it's much thicker on the back here. It looks like the crest of a wave. And some of the plastic bones that aren't real, actual human bone, it's actually a plastic model. It's hard to see this line here, but you can definitely see the intertrochanteric crest. So have a greater trochanter, a lesser trochanter. Here's the greater trochanter, and there's the lesser trochanter. And those are serving as sites for muscle attachments. On the posterior view, you can see a little more stuff. Let's erase this for a minute. On the posterior view of the, the, the femur itself, let's look at that. We have these gluteal tuberosities here. Come on. Gluteal tuberosity for the gluteal muscle insertions. Then you have the linea aspera for muscle insertions. And then you have the medial and lateral supracondyla lines. And now coming down, which one is a right? Which one is a left? Actually, they're telling you what it is. That's a right femur. This is the posterior right femur. You see how the, the femur head goes into the socket this way, right? And posterior, you can see the greater, you can see the um, uh, intertrochanteric crest much better on the posterior. Plus down here is another indication of posterior. You have two things here. They didn't mark this one. This right here is the popliteal fossa. And that's a, a very important uh, site, site popliteal, T-E-A, oh, come on, L, that's an I. The popliteal fossa is where the popliteal arteries are for doing pulses, very important. And um, I'll tell you here, so you have blood vessels coming through that. And I've had two patients in one summer have popliteal uh, aneurysms. Very weird, very strange summer. And that's the summer they sprayed for West Nile virus. I have no idea if that has any connection to it. It just so happens to be that's the same summer they sprayed really bad uh, chemicals for West Nile virus called uh, malathion, which is illegal and it killed off a lot of the fishing that killed off the lobster industry, believe it or not, and the lobster industry actually won a case out of court and got, I don't know, millions of dollars, the lobster fishermen of Long Island. And human beings were damaged too, you know? <laughs> not just aneurysm, a lot of different problems. But anyhow, that's a whole nother story for a movie coming up now. So we have... <laughs> They come down here. The popliteal fossa, I think, is really important because if you're a nurse or doing pulses uh, in a hospital, that's where you take. That's one of your pulses you must take on a regular basis as you do your rounds. You got to take a radial pulse, a carotid pulse, a uh, femoral pulse, and you got to take a popliteal pulse and a dorsal pedis pulse in the foot. And they have the checking your circulation, you know. But uh, right in between here, they're marking the intercondylar fossa. That's just below it. It's between these two big condyles. This is the lateral condyle. This is the medial condyle. This is the medial epicondyle. And this is the lateral epicondyle. Attachment sites for muscles. And now just above the medial condyle, they have this area called the adductor tubercle for the adductor muscles. And, you know, there's another sign, you know, people have knee problems. One of the signs is uh, swelling of the adductor um, bursa there, um, and they call that medial compartment syndrome. It's a very common thing. So you palpate here and see swelling around this spot right here at the adductor tubercle. Uh, it's a very common thing. What else we got here? 
Here, you can see the lateral picondyle here. And you have the patella surface anteriorly for the patella to sit within its space and track as you bend your knee, right? Okay. Um, the leg, that means below the knee, when they say leg. The tibia and the fibula, they form the skeleton of the lower leg. They are connected to each other by the interosseous membrane, kind of like the, tib uh, the radius and the ulna were. They articulate with the femur proximally and with the ankle distally. They also articulate with each other via immovable or semi-movable is a good, better way of saying it, tibiofibula joints. The tibia uh, receives the weight of the body, so that most of your weight of the body is on the tibia. The fe uh, fibula does not really take up the brunt of the weight of the body like the tibia does. The two femoral condyles are sitting right on top of the tibial plateau. And so they transmit the weight from the tibia, from the rest of the body to the tibia, and that transmits it to the foot. And the major markings include the medial and lateral condyles, the intercondyla eminence, and the tibial tuberosity, which is a very fascinating location. And then you have an anterior crest and a medial malleolus, that's the ankle on the medial side. And then there's a fibula notch to receive the fibula distally. Here we go. So nice view of the uh, tibia, and you're seeing this big guy right here. This is a cool spot. That's your tibial tuberosity. Let's talk about that for a minute. The tibial tuberosity is clinically important for several reasons. One, it's the attachment for the quadriceps muscles through via the patella ligament. So the patella has to attach there too. And the patella shares that ligament with the four quadriceps muscles of the thigh, the anterior thigh, the big muscles. And they're the muscles that extend your knee and they insert at that location. Now, clinically, what happens here are several things. Let's talk about um, children, growing children going through the growing years, the formative years like adolescence or just pre-adolescence. If a, if a person is very active, especially boys, they get really strong, you get a sudden burst of hormones or whatever. And girls too, they can be very strong and very athletic and it pulls on the attachment to the uh, tibial tuberosity. So the quadriceps are pulling here, but it just so happens to be that this is a growth plate. So this is where the metaphysis is. And there's a growth plate down here, right? So this growth plate is right at the site where the attachment of the quadriceps is, which is not a very ideal spot if you think about it. And so as the quads are pulling on this, it actually sometimes pulls the bone away from the cartilage below and it kind of tears it a little bit, almost like what's called an avulsion fracture. An avulsion fracture is when a tendon is pulling right off the bone and it takes a chunk of bone with it. So this condition that happens here at the tibial tuberosity, and it's common in adolescents and growing children, what they call it growing pain sometimes, the doctor would just call it growing pains. It's actually called Osgood O-S-G-O-O-D, Osgood Schlatter's disease, S-C-H-L-O-T-T-E-R-S. -T -T -E Some of you may have had it, you don't even know. And the doctor may call, have called it growing pains. All right, so another clinical significance about this spot, especially since this bone will eventually have good bone marrow, right, and blood, and in a child, it's still very soft. So for years, they used it in... Um, in a toddlers or below for an IV spot in emergency medicine and they take a little screw it's like a screw gun or a screw handheld screw thing and they screw in an IV right into that spot this way that the toddler can't rip it out because they tend to rip IVs out they also used it in the military very commonly when they evac somebody on a helicopter and the wind and stuff can knock it out so they put it that way also the the person could be out of it and just try and pull their IVs out. And I understand now in pre-hospital medicine or emergency medicine, it's pretty, it's used commonly when patient is unconscious and had severe injuries and they may be a little combat combative if they woke up. So now they're doing it on those patients as well. So it's called uh, an IO. They give the patient an IO. 
that's an interosseous IV, an IOIV into the tibial tuberosity. Okay, so we have an anterior border coming down out of the tibia. You have the intercondylar eminence, which is right up at top, and that's where the cruciate ligaments attach, the anterior and the posterior cruciate ligaments attach here. And then you have this tibial plateau on the top or the articular surface of the medial condyle and lateral condyle. And that's where the meniscus will be up top. So there'll be a meniscus on either side uh, up here, and that would be articulating with the femoral condyles. And so this is a very important site as well. And this is that um, interosseous membrane coming down. And now this, this is the right knee or right lower limb, right tibia right here. This is the right fibula. The tibia forms the medial side of the, uh, the ankle called the medial malleolus. We don't call that a styloid process. We call that the medial malleolus on a test. And then down here, this the fibula is forming the lateral malleolus. And between them, there's a, there's a slightly movable joint called the distal tibial fibula joint, which so happens to be a very uh, interesting joint as far as people who had past injuries to their ankle and then they have difficult time uh, with shin splints or uh, problems with jumping. It hurts to jump or run after a while. Um, what happens is the, there's another bone that's going to sit underneath this, right? The talus bone of the foot. And the talus sometimes uh, cannot go into, the foot can't go into dorsiflexion because there was old injuries in your scar tissue and then your body held this really tight. And uh, if you adjust this joint, if it needs it, very gentle adjustment, now the foot can go into dorsiflexion and then their shin splints will go away. And this, we'll talk about this in the lab a little bit. It's called closed pack. When you, um, we're going to look at the foot in a minute. So when you go to jump or run, you have to actually kind of squat a little bit to jump and bring your, it's actually bringing your shins forward, right? And it's really, and technically, the foot is becoming locked up into that space. So it's called close pack. The foot becomes closely packed in here and the two bones create a good, uh, f resistance so that you can push off. If you don't go into closed pack, then these the muscles around here are all going to work overtime and you start building inflammation into this compartment and that's when you get the shin splints. Very common. I call it closed pack syndrome. I've never heard anybody call it that. I call it that because you're not able to get into closed pack because of an old injury and resistance, uh, restriction of movement of the sub joint. That's the, 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 tal the joint between the talus here and the ankle here or the tibiofibula joint. And there's actually a tibiofibula joint up here too at the head. So this is the head of the fibula and this is the uh, lateral malleolus. Uh, most of the movement's here, but there is some give and movement here when you dorsiflex your foot. So we have um, the fibula, which is a stick-like bone. It's uh, like I just discussed there. It's slightly expanded at the ends, located lateral. Remember, that's lateral to the tibia. And the major markings include the head and the lateral malleolus. And it forms a joint with the tibia. Now, the joint between the tibia down here now is going to articulate with the talus. This is the talus, the first one of the first bones of the, of the foot. And then underneath is the calcaneus, and that's what you your heel. Uh, so the skeleton of the foot includes the tarsal bones or tarsus. These are the tarsal bones from here over here. These are the metatarsals, and these are the phalanges. And just like the hand, the same number of metatarsals as metacarpals, and the same number of phalanges as the phalanges in the hand. And instead of carpal bones, we have tarsal bones. And so this first one at the top, and you see it says the trochlea of the talus. So it's going to pivot on that distal portion of the tibia. And that allows your foot to go into dorsiflexion. Okay. And the foot supports the body weight and acts as a lever to propel the body forward. But if you really need to jump and really run, you have to bring this into 
close pack. To, and close pack means that the talus becomes closely packed in between the tibia and the fibula. That's what it means. So now we have several bones here. We have the talus here. Let me just erase a little bit. Alrighty. So you have the talus with a trochlea at the top that's articulating with the tibia. And you have the calcaneus, that's your heel, you know, mazel tov at a, at a Jewish wedding, and you're hitting the bottom of the calcaneus to break that glass, right? And then just anterior to the talus is the navicula. And then anterior to that are the cuneiforms. Now you have a medial cuneiform, most medially. Sometimes they call cuneiform Roman numeral one. Let me erase that other thing there. Okay. And then you have the medial cuneiform, I mean the intermediate, which would be number two, and then the lateral cuneiform, which is number three. So sometimes you name these three little cuneiform bones as cuneiform one, two, or three, or a medial, intermediate, and lateral cuneiform. And the most lateral tar tarsal bone is the cuboid on the side here. See, it's articulating, cuboid's articulating with the calcaneus there and with the uh, metac metatarsals. These cuneiforms are articulating with the cuboid and the navicula and the met metatarsals. Navicula is articulating not only with them, it's also articulating with the talus. And then the talus is articulating below with the calcaneus. And calcaneus articulates with the cuboid too. They're all kind of moving together, kind of like in the wrist. And um, so this is the metatarsals here. It's named as one through five. And then these are the phalanges. The great toe is called hallux instead of pol pollux. H-A-L-L-U-X. That's the great toe. And the rest of the toes are number two through five. And so, and just like in the thumb, the great toe has only two phalanges, a proximal and distal, while all the other ones have a proximal, middle, and distal phalange. So the tarsal bones, again, composed of seven bones that form the posterior half of the foot. The body weight is carried primarily on the talus and the calcaneus. The talus articulates with the tibia and the fibula superiorly and the calcaneus inferiorly. You get that? So the talus is in between the tibia and the calcaneus and it's supporting a lot of the weight. And the other tarsal bones include the cuboid, navicula, medial, intermediate, and lateral cuneiforms or one, two, and three. Okay, so now what you're looking at here is a medial view of the foot. This is your calcaneus down here. Now look at the big gap here because you're supposed to have an arches in your feet and supporting yourself. So really only supposed to support your weight here and here, believe it or not. That's where most of your weight bearing should be. So here's the calcaneus and then here's your talus bone and on top, it's going to have a surface for the tibia to come on there. And the tibia is going to come down a little bit. And there's your medial malleolus right here. In front of the talus would be navicula. And then the medial cuneiform. Here's a lateral view. Here's your calcaneus on the bottom. And there's another portion of support. And you see the talus on top of the calcaneus. And also, the, uh, it has a facet for the lateral malleus. This is where the, the fibula is going to come into that facet joint. So it does articulate there and allows some movement. The calcaneus is the heel of the foot. It carries the talus on a superior surface, like I said. And it's a point attachment for the calcaneal or Achilles tendon of the sural group or calf muscles. And the metatarsals and phalanges, like I said, metatarsals is five. Um, the enlarged head of the metatarsal one forms the ball of the foot. That's important. And the phalanges, the 14 bones of the toes, each digit has three phalanges except for the hallux, which only has a, a 
It has no middle as a problem with this thing. Okay, here's the hallux. So here's a proximal and distal phalange of the hallux. This is a metatarsal one, two, three, four, and five. This is cuneiform one, two, three. And this one is the cuboid. This is your um, navicula. And this is all talus right here. And then the calcaneus underneath. There's arches of the foot. There's actually three arches of the foot. People don't realize that. And they're maintained by interlocking foot bones and strong ligaments. The arches allow the foot to hold up the weight. The arches are two lateral ones. Um, two, um, uh, you know, on either side, you have a lateral and a medial longitudinal arch, two longitudinal ones. And then you have the transverse arch going across transversely. The, the lateral longitudinal arch is going from the cuboid, okay? And the medial longitudinal arch is going from the talus. And the transverse arch runs obliquely from side to side, the foot to the other. Now, on the bottom of your foot, can the uh, tendon, the ligaments on the bottom of the foot can get inflamed if you start losing these arches and it's taking up too much stress underneath and people can get plantar fasciitis. And the plantar fasciitis, there's ligaments attaching here and tendons, and that could build up calcification at the calcaneus forming a heel spur. Now, people do not lose their, always lose their arches of the feet, but it's extremely common. I would say like 90% of the people in the world today, especially if you wear shoes and walk on hard ground, have loss of some of their arches. And if you have a loss of the arch, it's never perfect. Sometimes it's very asymmetrical, whereas it's flatter on one side than the other. And that's what has to be looked at to determine if it's causing a biomechanical fault with the rest of your spine, because it will flatten the foot out one side versus the other more, and that could create a pelvic imbalance, which then would translate through an entire spinal imbalance all the way up to the neck, the entire kinetic chain.